Uh, time and time again, especially in places that first introduced ECMO, uh, I've heard repeatedly around the country, uh, the nurses come up to me and say, have you ever had a survivor? And that's the picture that a lot of people have. It's either archaic or they're not picking patients appropriately. And I think the purpose of this talk is more to show that the results are more positive than we think they are, just the matter of your perspective. First, I'm going to just do a brief history of ECMO. Uh, I'm going to talk about the latest ECMO outcomes, a summary of the new developments, and some conclusions. So way back in 53, which is now about uh, 60 plus years ago, when Gibbon developed the heart-lung machine, that was the, essentially the birth of the origins of ECMO. And through the years, and these are not necessarily in the order in which they occurred, we got the membrane oxygenators, we started using ECMO and PEDS primarily for respiratory illness, and the outcomes for PEDS were pretty good. Centrifugal pumps were then introduced, decreasing the morbidity of ECMO. Uh, ultimately, we got more biocompatible, com biocompatible components, some working better than others. Solid hollow fiber, me fiber membranes were introduced. There were smaller portable configurations. Uh, we have the development of a dual lumen cannula for venovenous ECMO. And some very innovative cannulation techniques besides the single catheter dual lumen venous veno ECMO, especially for arterial uh, access have occurred. And finally, the, the penultimate uh, achievement has been ambulatory ECMO, which even in the present day, people think are unbelievable. So to summarize the indications for VA ECMO, they're a little bit looser than they are for VV ECMO. Cardiogenic shock is by far the most common indication, and you can see a listing of the conditions for which you would put a patient on venoarterial ECMO. An important one that has achieved increasing recognition in recent years, and there are many case reports out there, is the bridge to operation concept. So if you have a patient who's got an uncorrected cardiac condition who shows up in shock, should you operate on them then and there, or should you stabilize them with ECMO first? There have been case reports of numerous procedures, and I've done a few of these. Uh, car cardiac uh, post-infarct VSD, uh, ruptured papillary muscle, and a whole variety of conditions that are mechanical. Uh, some people even do it for acute ischemic conditions. Patient comes in with a huge infarct, rest them on ECMO, but that's less clear because you're sacrificing the coronary perfusion during that interval of time. But for mechanical complications of MI and some other conditions, they may be useful to salvage a patient. eCPR has become, has uh, gotten increasing recognition, uh, where primarily the ECMO is inserted in the emergency room on a patient who's undergoing CPR. Uh, this is probably the most difficult circumstance under which to, to patient, place a patient on ECMO and almost invariably requires you to use FEM-FEM because of the ongoing CPR. ECMO can also be useful for severe hypothermia. Although there are other endovascular devices available, nothing, nothing even comes close to the efficiency of the heart-lung machine for warming or cooling a patient. And increasingly, it's being used for organ retrieval. In some patients, uh, if a patient has had a, a cardiac arrest, they're placed on ECMO and they're brain dead. Some of them are kept on ECMO for organ retrieval. Increasingly, there's also the situation where a patient is brain dead beforehand and then has hemodynamic compromise, but they have good organs. And some of them are placed on ECMO. All these frontiers are being broadened. The last few obviously are minor indications, but just to let you know what is out there and what people are thinking of. For VV ECMO, the guidelines are a little bit more succinct and discreet. Uh, the ELSO guidelines are important when they distinguish between suggested indications for VV ECMO and strongly indicated for VV ECMO. And really, that decision is made best based on what the estimated mortality of the patient is without ECMO.
And so suggested is when the criteria suggest that the patient would have a 50% mortality without ECMO. And strongly indicate would be that we figured out that it's an 80% mortality. And the criteria for those items are listed there. I'm going to show you, for those who are not familiar with the Murray score, uh, what, the, what, what the included components are. Importantly, uh, if you partake in an ECMO program at all, the Murray score is a useful card for you to keep on you. Uh, the great utility of a, a team approach to ECMO is that uh, because of the circumstances, unlike most team approaches for cardiac procedures, this has got to be done fast. And the more people looking over each other's shoulder, the better. Um, separate guidelines from ELSO are just the indication of se severe hypoxemia with high PEEP, which we talked a little bit about yesterday. Uh, severe hypercapnia with a pH of less than 7.15 due to respiratory acidosis and high plateau airway pressures. Again, those indications are lesser than the ELSO guidelines. The Murray score. That should be the quiz question. Who's that guy? Anyone? Who's that a picture of? Murray. Murray who? Murray the cop. That dates everybody from the odd couple in the 70s. Anyway, it's a lung injury score. What it was first used for is estimated a, a patient's risk of dying if they had ARDS. And they can get either zero, one, two, three, or four points based on those four categories. Four is the worst, zero is the best. The ultimate score you get is not an, ad, you don't add them up, you divide it. So you do the average. So if uh, and you can only have, if you don't have for some reason uh, a calculation of your lung compliance or you can't do it, you can still get a Murray score based on the other three. You just get the average of whichever components you're able to achieve. And so remember we spoke about the survival of the patient without ECMO as an indication for uh, institution. You'll see that a Murray score between two and three uh, corresponds to a mortality of about 50%, and a Murray score between three and four is 80%. All right? I want to allude to some lessons we learned from mechanical circulatory support. That is the history of LVADs. You know, the initial outcomes with the durable mechanical support uh, were better than uh, uh, optimal medical management, but were not spectacular. This was back in the early 2000s, 2002, when the New England Journal published the rematch trial. Sure, we had much better survival with LVADs than with medical therapy, but it really wasn't palatable. Problem was the original heart mate, average lifespan of that was about 16 months. And it's bulky, it's loud, and all the other things for now, what's a historic device, all right? It didn't catch on, and there was a high morbidity and mortality for that procedure ongoing with the HeartMate 1. It slowly got better, but really what we learned over time and how we improved those rates were a combination of three things. And those of us in the MCS field know that this, from its early origins, that we focused on these three categories of areas of how do we get outcomes better. Pre-op patient selection, better technology and better operation, and optimize the perioperative care. Nothing earth-shattering about those categories, but it helps in thinking about how do we move forward with ECMO. In terms of the current outcomes, here's a listing of VA ECMO studies from recent years. And you can see in the, uh, in the last column, 30-day 30 30 survival is all over the board, but ranges from the 20s to the 60s. And by and large, the average 30-day survival, average discharge from the hospital is about 40% overall for VA ECMO. Easy way to remember it is they add up to 100. VA ECMO, 40%. VV ECMO, 60%. Okay? And those numbers are a little bit rough, but it's the easiest way to remember them. And VV ECMO, like, uh, accordingly. You know, we had survival to discharge as low as in the 20s, and in, in these studies, as high as 60, but more recent ELSO data 
indicate that the outcomes are closer to 60%. Now, um, a lot of this depends on who you're putting ECMO on. I remember when H1N1 became prevalent about six years ago, there were those patients that did fine on ECMO. They just never could come off because the lung was so destroyed that they were never going to recover. And a lot of times you don't know that up front, how devastating the lung injury is. All you have are the chest x-ray. I'll tell you, the chest x-rays look the same if the patient's going to recover or not. The only thing that tells is time. So uh, in part, we are a victim of the disease process itself and how it evolves. So the latest data from, as of January of this year from the ELSO registry are as follows. Worldwide, the number of active ECMO centers has grown uh, phenomenally, all right? Here's about a, oh, 25-year history, and you can see in the last five years, it's grown quite a bit. The black line represents the number of, uh, the cumulative number of runs, and the blue represent what's done in each year, and they use the appropriate y-axis. So worldwide, uh, last year, 5,000 patients were placed on, on ECMO. I'm sorry, 5,000 centers were placing patients on ECMO. Here is a, a graph using 100% as the total number of ECMO cases. What were the proportions of the different kinds of ECMO and who were they done on? In the early years, in the 90, the vast majority, this lightish blue, was neonatal pulmonary. All right, and you can see that's dwindled. The two largest categories now that have been growing are adult respiratory and cardiac ECMO. And now they constitute greater than half and probably 60% of ECMO worldwide. Here's a graph of the adult respiratory cases. The black line shows cumulatively what have been, what have been done worldwide. So that is running at about 7,000. Annual runs worldwide last year. Remember, these are those that participate in ELSO. So the number is a, is a modest number. Uh, so last year, about 1,500 were placed for respiratory. Uh, this is the same graph for cardiac. So again, there's been a total of about 6,000 done, and last year, 1,200 patients were placed on VA ECMO. This is the overall results. I'm going to focus here because most of this talk is on the adult world, which I have boxed in. Uh, and it's important to distinguish between surviving from ECMO and surviving to discharge. And you'll see, for instance, for respiratory, the 65% of patients were able to be weaned, but only 57% of the same base number were able to be discharged. So we have some attrition. Same thing occurs with cardiac and with eCPR. But if you look at overall the survival to discharge, respiratory is about 60%, cardiac 40%, and eCPR at 28%, not surprisingly. These are very important numbers to reinforce with your program, particularly if you're just starting a program. Okay, what happens is people see these miraculous stories on TV and they get skewed. And you want to make sure your administration, nursing staff, everyone in the hospital understands what you're up against. Okay, it's essentially like flipping a coin whether the patient survives or not. And you can have a string of deaths. In terms of the survival by the diagnosis, you can see the var there's varying survivals. These are respiratory conditions. Viral pneumonia has the best and the worst are distributed among other conditions. And you can see a good proportion of the cases, there really is no diagnosis or it falls into a miscellaneous category. And here's the same thing for cardiac, okay? Uh, the best uh, survivals in general for cardiac are the post-cardiotomy patients, which weren't separately categorized here. And why would you expect that post-cardiotomy has better survival than in the other states? Why would you think? 
I'm, the repair is done. That's one. Second thing, two, two, two main things. It's acute, and more importantly, you're able to institute therapy promptly, right? You're in the OR, the injury has occurred, you've tried to wean from the pump, you've gone back on and off however many times, but generally speaking, from the first time that you recognize as a problem till the time you've initiated ECMO support, it's on order of a few hours at most. Uh, for these other conditions, it's not. People are trying to uh, save the patient by less uh, drastic measures. Here is the survival by diagnosis and by year. In the early years, things were very erratic because there were very few cases. But you can see things are kind of converging. And there's a range based on the diagnosis in adult survival, and this is for the respiratory components, of somewhere between 50 and 70 in that category, with a mean of, again, around 60. Cardiac, the same thing. There's a little bit more dispersal, but again, focusing on the 40% arena. If we look at the history of ECMO in all the patients, we can see that on respiratory, the survival has been gradually improving. The slope is very shallow, but it's been improving. Same thing holds true for cardiac support. I'm gonna talk now about some of the innovations that have appeared recently that have challenged the conventional paradigms that we know about ECMO and what we do. One is smaller arterial cannula size. Um, when I teach people who want to do eCPR, I teach them to put the smallest arterial cannula as possible because in the setting of CPR, the patient's, depending on the patient's body habitus, putting a percutaneous arterial cannula can be very difficult, especially if the vessels are calcified. So I advocate putting a smaller cannula, and what I mean by small is a 15 French. And sacrificing some of your flow conditions, if, the pay, if you can get, right, the most important thing is to get the patient on pump quickly. All right? And I'd rather do that with partial support earlier than full support later. You can always upsize under more controlled conditions. What other tool do you have to favorably influence the oxygen supply-demand imbalance at your disposal? So I'm going to rephrase it. You may not be getting the flows that you want with the patient for an adequate cardiac index, calculated cardiac index. How can you improve the relative perfusion to the organs of the body? Something that you can do with your ECMO machine. Cool. Cool. I swear these are not trick questions. I know they seem like they are. But cool them. Okay. And how will you know? Well, one thing you can do is check your SVO2. You know. And your SVO2, when you cool them, should be preserved. And it usually will go up as you cool them. And so, again, in the ED or in the OR, when it's not your case, you, uh, there's a liver transplant and all of a sudden there's clot everywhere and your whole team is rushing in, put a smaller arterial cannula and cool the patient right away, okay? There are some downsides of cooling and I only cool to about 33 degrees, but I think the upsides are much more important in the acute shock because what you wanna do is you wanna cool and resuscitate all right, and then you can think about what you're gonna do. You're gonna add another cannula, switch the cannula, but get to that patient. Time is muscle, time is brain, time is kidney. All right, uh, Columbia looked retrospectively at their series, so this was not a, a randomized control study. Columbia, who's got a great deal of experience with ECMO, looked retrospectively at 100 patients that were done over, I guess, about a prolonged period of time. And they broke them up retrospectively into those that got 15 French cannula and those that got bigger ones. Right from the start, I said, this is gonna be worthless because 
you may put a 15 French in a smaller patient, and it may not be comparable. But in truth, as you'll see, the patient groups were pretty comparable in size and in other conditions. And what they looked at is what were the outcomes at 24 hours and the complications. Here is uh, some differences in the baseline characteristics, but if you look at the BMI and the BSA, they were very, very close. So it wasn't that smaller cannulas were put primarily in smaller patients. There, are other, there were other things that were notable, and just like I had mentioned in my recommendation, the smaller cannulas tended to go more commonly in patients who were undergoing CPR. Okay, not exclusively, but more commonly. In terms of the, where the procedure was done, smaller cannula generally went in at the bedside, not in the OR, right? Again, not under the best conditions. So take home message from the, these things are, if you're in the OR and it's a controlled situation, put the cannula that you're supposed to be putting in. But if it's in bad circumstances, in bad places, when you don't have great lighting, put something to get the patient on partial support at the very least. Um, you'll see that as expected in table four on the right, the flows were better with the larger cannula. So the mean flow was 4.4 liters with the larger cannula and 3.2 in the smaller. And the cardiac index, the flow index was 2.2 versus 1.7. Okay. Also, the mean arterial pressure was lower with the smaller cannula. And the SVO2, although it didn't achieve statistical significance, was higher with the larger cannula. But they did not use cooling as part of their treatment regimen. In terms of the, uh, first of all, the outcome survivals were the same. Okay. The cannulation site bleeding was much higher in patients that had larger cannulas. And the overall bleeding was much higher. The bigger the hole you make in a vessel, the more problematic it can be. Moving to a different topic that we've mentioned a couple of times, and that's ambulatory ECMO. What exactly is this? Now, the idea really came into being for patients that would be lung transplant or heart-lung transplants that were not doing well, in much the same way that we bridge cardiac patients for a heart transplant. And we were hoping that the reason to do this is under more semi-elective circumstances, not in the patient who's got florid ARDS and is dying in the medical ICU. And the rationale behind ambulatory ECMO, as we spoke about yesterday, is that the upright position is better for the patient, Lung disease does not benefit from paralysis and sedation, and lung disease does not uh, benefit from being on positive pres pressure ventilation. And so if we can rest along with a spontaneously breathing patient, that would be the goal. Now these are few and far between, okay? If you're doing five to 10 ECMOs a year, you're probably not gonna see the patients that do this. And the vast majority of these are VV ECMO patients, although VA ECMO ambulatory can be done as well, and I'll show you that. So here's obviously a patient that's ambulating around in the unit who's on VV ECMO. It's obviously a great deal, but I, I wanna remind you guys who are old enough, if you remember the first consoles for the HeartMate in the, in the ni early 90s that uh, it was like a bus. And until recently, the total artificial heart had a huge console. So this is the, the conventional VV ECMO with the Avalon cannula. And I'm happy to say that most VV ECMOs are now done this way. I think it's caught on fairly rapidly. It's nice to have one cannula. Of course, it's also nice for it to be in the neck. Groin cannulation can be very treacherous, and I have never seen, I, I watch tomorrow, I'll have one, but I've never seen bleeding from the neck cannula. And the reason for that is that the so solution to that is just sitting the patient up. All right, you lower their CVP, and if there is any oozing, it'll stop. Uh, it can be tricky to put this cannula in, uh, I tend to use both echo and fluoroscopy. I've found that there's been deficiencies when you only use one or the other, but it can be done with one or the other. 
you have to have a very competent echocardiographer that's sure where that wire is going. There have been case reports of the cannula going right through the apex of the right ventricle, and that usually doesn't end well. There's also been hybrid. Now, these ambulatory ECMO cases that I'm talking about are mostly for, again, respiratory. Uh, in patients that have been placed on VV ECMO through the dual lumen cannula, if you've done and optimized everything there is to do to get the patient satisfactorily oxygenated and you're still struggling, meaning you've taken care as best as you can of the recirculation, the cannula is in the appropriate position and orientation, and you've done all the other things, you can add a small arterial cannula in the axillary artery. What this does is it takes care of that hypoxemic burden of the blood going through the lungs to augment your arterial output on the other side. We also have partial bypass walking ECMO. This is with cannulas inserted in the, in the axillary artery and the internal jugular vein. Generally speaking, you can't do full flow but if someone can get away with two to three liters per minute, this can be effective. Many of these are patients who are being bridged for other endpoints. There's pulmonary bypass. If you have a patient who's got bad pulmonary hypertension and is listed for a lung transplant, you can actually perform ECMO without a pump in the circuit because the RV is usually very uh, uh, strong. And so the RV can pump it through the, uh, out of the graft attached to the pulmonary artery and then into the left atrial appendage. So you're bypassing the pulmonary circuit and it's going through an oxygenator under your own cardiac contraction. And it's a unique scenario because it requires that you have an RV that's working well, which for patients who are not in decompensated pulmonary hypertension, they are because the RV is used to the pulmonary hypertension. You could have an oxy-RVAD in patients with end-stage pulmonary disease that you're bridging to a lung transplant, where you cannulate the right atrium and the PA, and you put an oxygenator in the circuit, assuming that the LV is OK. And you can have walking cardiopulmonary bypass with central cannulation, usually used with uh, um, the Abiumed cannulas and an ECMO circuit. And these patients are being bridged most commonly to heart-lung. These are not commonly performed, but people are pushing the envelope. I've already mentioned the indications for each of these, so we're going to skip that, and I'm going to skip the decision tree too. So taking this all together, are the results laughable? For VA ECMO, the expected survival discharge is now 40%. Without ECMO, I would say generously that the expected survival is 10%. Even though we say that there's 80% chance of mortality in the patients you should put on ECMO, most of us know that the time these patients get referred to us, almost none of them will survive. Therefore, VA ECMO at the very least quadruples your chance of survival and probably much more. For VV ECMO, the expected survival discharge is 60%. Without ECMO, I'm going to be a little bit more generous, generous and say your expected survival is 20% with a pulmonary condition. Therefore, VV ECMO at least triples your chance of survival. And I'll even stress it another way, which is really from an epidemiological perspective, what you really want to look at is the number needed to treat to save one life. For VA ECMO, you treat just over three patients to save a life. And for VV ECMO, two and a half patients. That is one of the most impressive number needed to treat numbers you'll see in any studies in the literature. It's a matter of perspective. I don't think this is laughable. Can we do better? Sure we can. And I've listed there, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into them but some of the things that are being instituted to improve ECMO outcomes, all right? In terms of the pre-op patient selection, I think it's very important to establish an ECMO team. A, a critical care specialist, a surgeon, and a pulmonologist, including members of the staff that are gonna be 
uh, critically important taking care of these patients. And the reason for that is you want to have a go-to person and you want to develop protocols that are appropriate and try to get the word out of how we, when these we should be called. The, the stimulus for calling a cardiac surgeon or whoever is putting in the ECMO should not be that patients meet the absolute criteria for entry. It should be the probable ones where they're not as sick. And what it means for us as surgeons is we go there with an open mind. We don't go there rushing up with a cannula. Okay, we see the patient, we talk with the pulmonologist if it's respiratory, and we come up with a plan of when to intervene. And we define specific endpoints. Okay, if in six hours you're not down on your FiO2, or if you're having to go up on your PEEP, we're going to the OR and define those endpoints. We need further improvements in technology. Question is whether we should, as we did with cardiopulmonary bypass, introduce some pulsatility in the algorithm because we do know in the acute shock state, pulsatility opens microcirculatory gates. At any given mean arterial pressure in a patient in shock, pulsatility adds 20% to the effective perfusion of the tissues. It's not important for the chronic patient, but for the acute patient, yes. And finally, optimizing the perioperative care, which I've mentioned a couple of things already. It's helpful to hand out cards to the referring physicians. For the case of VV ECMO, you pulmonologists, this is a card that I've handed to every referring physician for our LVAD program. Easy to remember criteria of when to call me. I made a mnemonic called Dashboard, and I fit them all in. They all have it in their offices, up on their, on their uh, walls. Nobody's having to wonder. And I tell them, if a patient meets any of these criteria, call me. Doesn't mean that the patient's going to get an LVAD. It means we're going to start thinking about it and educating the patient about it. And the same thing for our TAVR program. Perception is everything here. We all know about the half empty, half full, and so when we say are the ECMO results laughable, we're taking a half empty perspective, okay? And I'm not even sure that we should be looking at it half full either. I think the more appropriate thing to do is what's stated here from Mark Deval. Some people see the glass as half full, others see the glass as half empty, the enlightened are simply grateful to have a glass. And we should think the same way about ECMO. Elmo, no, Elmo is no longer laughing. He is smiling. Thank you.